do is when we come in, I like to say the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and then we have a seat and take a, a moment of silence. I practice uh, Matthew 6, 1 through 4, and um, so that's kind of how we, we do it. Um, uh, and then after that, after the moment of silence, then we'll get into the class. <coughs> so if I could ask everybody to turn your phasers to stun at this point in time, um, that way it's not inter uh, um, disrupting us. Uh, we're all adults, uh, so, and I understand that we all have other things to do and other things going on, and this would all be easy if life didn't get in the way. So if you have a problem with you have your phone on vibrate, if your phone goes off and you need to answer it, just get up and go answer your phone and come back. Um, or answer your phone and leave if you need to. Um, but that's all on you as, as adults. Um, I'm nobody's babysitter. And all my kids are gone, so I don't need to raise any anymore. Uh, so tonight, tonight's just the introduction. We'll get going on that. But if I could ask everybody to stand, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may have a seat. Let's take a moment of silence. Looks like everyone's ready. All right, tonight's the first night uh, introduction. Um, this is the class introduction to our founding principles. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of territory in this class. It's a 28 week class. Um, Jason's videotaping the class and he's putting it on Facebook Live just in case if people miss classes, they can go back and see that. Um, or if there's other people you're trying to get interested in the class and they want to see one and see what it's all about, they're, they're more than happy to go to that Facebook page and take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> I want to be real clear here when I get started. There's the, there's the law, there's the theory of the law, and then there's reality. And we're going to be dealing in all three of those realms in this class. The theory of law, the law, and reality. Um, and the Constitution is the supreme law, and that's where we have to start. But the Constitution, um, our founding fathers, as genius as they were, didn't just sit down one day and say, yeah, you know what, let's start a whole new thing. And I think I got a pretty good idea, let's do this. This happened from uh, a, a long history that they studied in different genealogical documents, five genealogical documents that came about because of things in history that happened and they learned from that. It was Patrick Henry himself that said, uh, I have but one lamp to guide my path and that's the lamp of, of experience. I know no way of judging of the future but by the past. And if you know in our John Dewey model public schools, we are horribly lacking in history. Why is it history is one of the things that they kept taking out and taking out and civics they took out for social, social studies and now it's pushed way back. Um, and that is because ignorance uh, makes people easy to enslave. Um, during the slave days, they wouldn't let slaves learn to read. Do you know why? Because if they learned to read, they could get knowledge. If they got knowledge, it was hard to keep them as slaves. 
So why do you think our children are being dumbed down and turned into slaves uh, all over? And uh, the only way we're going to stop that is first we have to get the tool of knowledge. We have to understand it. Then we have to go out and we have to teach it to others. So embarking on this class is going to be a huge responsibility because I'm a big believer in when much is given, much is required and expected. So when you're given knowledge, you're going to be required and expected to do something with that knowledge. And that is, you need to pass it on. You need to teach your children, your neighbors, your grandchildren. Um, if we don't do it, the organized school system is not going to do it. So it's up to us to do that. So if you go to your packets that I've handed out, everybody, we'll go through the syllabus really quickly <laughs> and uh, through some of, the, some of the things that are in that packet. Um, everything that I'll be touching on is pretty much in that packet and I've uh, listed everything in the syllabus of where this information comes from. So uh, tonight's uh, week one and tonight is uh, November 28th and we'll be meeting every Monday for the next 28 weeks and I've got the dates there. So uh, next week we're going to look at a video. I played just a little bit of it tonight as I was getting things set up. Chris Ann Hall's video, the 700 plus years of history. Uh, and she does, uh, she's got a three video series there that she does, the Bill of Rights. But the first video is the one we're going to pay attention to because she brings about that 700 years of history in those five genealogical documents that our founding fathers plagiarized from to draw up the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. <clears throat> Um, and yes, they did plagiarize a lot of it, because a true principle is a true principle. It doesn't matter who said it, it's still a true principle. And if it's a true principle, you rewrite it. So, she's going to start with that. We're going to start at about the year 1040. Now, the reason for starting at the year 1040 is that's where King Edward brought us the common law. That's where the common law comes from. And you'll start to understand the common law. When we look at the common law, we have to understand uh, all of this in the context of the very basic knowledge of what the law is. And that is man is born of God and operates under the pleasure of God. And because of that, man has rights, and those rights are inherited. And those rights are protected by the common law in the Constitution. That's why we start at 1040. Now, corporations are born of government. They operate under the pleasure of government, and thereby they're granted privileges. And those privileges are protected by statutes and the Uniform Commercial Code. So when we start understanding that as the basis of the law, which is what always used to be taught in law schools, that is not anymore, and it's not taught in our police academies anymore. Brad, was it taught in the police academy when you went through? So that's the very basis of the law. When we understand the very <coughs> basis of the law, it makes all the rest of this make a lot more sense. Um, then week three, we're going to go into the 1100s Charter of Liberty in depth. And um, if you look in your packet, that's that 1100s Charter of Liberty is in there, word for word. Because one of the things that we're going to do is we're not going to take somebody's rendition of what those documents say. We're actually going to read them for ourselves. Because there's this little thing I like to use. It's called critical thinking. I don't want somebody to tell me what to think or how to feel. I want to look at the original document, read it for myself. And based on my experience, my lamp of experience, I want to critically think about it and decide what I believe and what I think. I don't want somebody telling me that. I'm fiercely independent that way. And so that's what we're going to do. And that's why you're going to have that 1100's Charter of Liberty in there. You're going to see that. One of the interesting things that I'm going to bring out, and which is one of the things that gets me thrown out of all the churches in Hillsdale, <laughs> where I'm from, <laughs> is uh, the very first thing in the 1100's Charter of Liberty says, the king shall not insert himself into the church. That's critical. That's a very key point, that the king shall not insert himself into the church. And then we get to uh, week four, which is the Magna Carta of 1215 in depth. 
Now, a lot of times the study of the Constitution in, the, in, um, in our Americanism starts at 1215. But it doesn't really start at 1215. It starts at 1040. And if you don't understand the, where the common law comes from and how that came to be in, into the genealogical documents of the 1100s uh, uh, Charter of Liberty, then you don't understand what the Magna Carta 1215 was built upon, right? So anytime you build something, you have a foundation, and you build upon that foundation. If you're missing the foundation and you try to build on top, what do you have? So you have to understand the foundation, and it starts at 1040, and then the 1100 Charter of Liberty, the Magna Carta 1215, we're gonna study, anybody remember the story of Robin Hood? <clears throat> so this is the time period, the Magna Carta 1215. King John was a, a absolute wretch. Um, in fact, the people said that uh, when he died, he fouled the very depths of hell with his presence. That's how despicable he was. He was an absolutely horrible, despicable, despotic human being. And uh, because of that, uh, that story of, uh, of Robin Hood, um, this is during that time period and what was going on. This is where that story comes from. Now, does anybody remember what Robin Hood is famous for? Anybody? The rich to the poor. Ah, everybody says that, right? Mm -hmm. But he didn't steal from the rich. Mm -hmm. Robin Hood only stole from the crown because it was King John that was robbing the people with taxes. And if the people couldn't pay their taxes and they couldn't even eat, he would cut their hands off or disembowel them or draw and quarter them just because they couldn't pay their taxes. So the story of Robin Hood was Robin Hood didn't steal from the rich and give to the poor. That's a progressive ideology that's crept into our vernacular of the 20th century. And that's simply not true. He only stole from the crown. He didn't steal from the common, ordinary person or even the rich. He only stole from the crown. He took back the taxes that the people were forced to give and gave it back to them so that they could live another day. That's the true story of Robin Hood. So we're going to get into the Magna Carta and what was brought about that. Um, King John signed that not because he all of a sudden had an epiphany and turned into a great person, but it's odd what you'll do with a sword to your throat. And that's what he did. He signed the Magna Carta 1215 with a sword to his throat. Then we're going to look at the Grand Remonstrance of 1641 in depth. Now this was during the period of Charles I. Charles I was also another wretch. Not near as bad as John, but still bad enough. Um, Charles was the one that wanted to keep the civil war, the 30-year civil war that was going on in, in uh, England, he wanted to keep doing that, and he had a standing army, and, but he needed taxes. And now the monarchy in England wasn't really a true monarchy. And uh, so we have to understand the different forms of government, and we'll get into that too. But they weren't a true mon mon monarchy. So they, they needed the House of Commons and the House of Lords to be able to raise taxes. And the king wanted more taxes, and the parliament said no. So he disbanded them. He said, okay, well, if you're not going to do what I want, then you're just disbanded. And when he disbanded them, he said, well, I still need money. But oddly enough, he still knew that there's a law, and that he has to stay true to the law. So he knew he couldn't raise taxes, so he came up with this great idea. He said, we'll do a forced loan. We'll go to the people, we'll go to the knights and the noblemen, and we'll make them give us money as a forced loan, not tax. Isn't that nice that they did word games back then, too? So, uh, you know, a rose by any other name is still a rose. So if you're forcing <coughs> people to give you money so that you can carry on a 30-year 30 30 uh, religious civil war, then is it not just taxation under a different name? So we like to do that. Even today, in our modern government, we like to just change the name of something and make it sound good. And then when we make it sound good, it doesn't sound like theft or extortion, which is what it really is. 
So if we just make it a different name, everything's good. So um, that was the Grand Remonstrance uh, of 1641. Now, you have to know Charles, um, at some point in time, was tried as a, a traitor and had his head cut off. And so we'll, go, we'll get into that, that history. So if you notice in most of these documents, the establishment of power didn't embrace these documents with open arms. They embraced the documents through force. And it was the people that forced them to sign those documents. It was those people that forced them to that. This is why later on you're going to find out we the people are the government. Those people that we elect are our servants. And we've been using a word game through the 20th century too long where we call them our political leaders. If you call somebody a political leader long enough, they feel like they're here and you're here. And that's not the way it is. They are our political servants. They are here and we are here. And they will only serve us when we become the true masters of the law and good bosses. We've been horrible bosses for way too long. And so the first thing to becoming a good boss is this knowledge, and, we're, and that's what we're going to start going through. So then we have the... Um, <clears throat> did I get that out of... I'm sorry. The, the uh, Petition of Right is 1628. We had that first, before we go to the Grand Remonstrance in 1641. Now, the petition to write was the same thing. They said, okay, government, you're getting a little bit too out of hand. And so what we're going to do is we're going to bring you back to this. So in the 1100s Charter of Liberty, and in the um, uh, Magna Carta, and in the petition of right of 1628, and even in the Grand Remonstrance, it started out, the king shall not insert himself in the church, and then the king shall not insert himself in the church. And then the king shall not insert himself in the church. And then it was shame on the king for inserting himself in the church. That was the Grand Remonstrance, 1641. And then we got to the British Bill of Rights of 1689. Now something a little different happened with this. After King James and Charles, they said we no longer want anyone connected to the Catholic Church as... Part, as, our, as our leaders, as our king or queen, because they take an oath to Rome and not an oath to the people of Britain, and not an oath to the law of the laws of Britain. And so we're going to see in that um, the British Bill of Rights of 1689 is the first time that we had a king and queen of England. So you had Charles of Orange and Mary, who was the rightful heir to the throne, Mary was, but Mary and uh, Charles were Protestants, and when they came to Mary and said, we don't want James's son to be king because he's been raised Catholic, we want you to be the queen, you're the rightful heir to the throne, she said, I will not rule over my husband. So the uh, um, House of Lords came to her and said, how about if we make you and him king and queen. And she said, that I'll do. And so they made them king and queen. And in the uh, British Bill of Rights of 1689, there was a new thing that happened here. And they tried it down through, but now there's this thing where the king and queen had to take an oath to the law, to support the law placing themselves under the law just like everyone else. And they took an oath to it. Now we have something of the same thing in our Constitution, which is Article 6, Section 1, Clause 3, which is the oath of office that people have to take. We have a little problem with that in today's world. We've got a lot of people that take an oath to something that they don't even understand, nor can they explain what it was that they took an oath to. I, I happen to be the state director of the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association in Michigan. And I go around and I talk to a lot of police officers. And um, I ask them, did you take an oath to the Constitution? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, have you read the Constitution? Oh, yeah, I read it. 
I ask him a fifth grade question. How many articles in the Constitution? The, the different answers would astound you. Okay? How many people here have read the Constitution? How many articles? We got one, two right, three right. There's seven simple articles to the Constitution. Seven simple ones. And when we get to the Constitution, we're going to learn what those are. We're going to be able to recite what those are. And because we're able to recite what those are, anytime we have a question, we're going to know exactly where to go to look to answer a question. Because I don't expect anybody to memorize the Constitution. But when I was in the military, in the Army, and we went for rank, it was called going to the murder board. And what happened was you had about four, you had about four first sergeants sitting there and one sergeant major uh, sitting on the murder board. And they would ask you a series of questions. And I remember my first one. They asked me crazy questions like how many trucks are there on post? Well, there's only one. It's on top of the main flagpole. And what's in that truck? And they ask you all those things. And then they'd ask you things about Army regulations. Well, man, that's, a, you know, that's about that much stuff to memorize. And I was sweating it. So my answer to the Sergeant Major was, well, I don't know that, Sar that, that answer, Sergeant Major, but if I, I can look in 600-8-1, um, and I'll get back with you on that answer. I passed because the Sergeant Major said, we don't expect you to know all of the Army regulations, but we do expect you to, to know where to go and get the information if you're going to be a non-commissioned <coughs> officer. Well, if you're going to be a true master of the law, we expect you to know where to go to get the answers that you're looking for. Because too many times in the 20th century and the 21st century, we become used to, if I want to know somebody, I, uh, something, I call somebody and ask them what their opinion is. Do you really want to give your power up to somebody else like that? Do you really trust somebody that much to tell you what you should believe and what you should know and what you should think? I don't like giving that power up to somebody. I like to look it up for myself. I like to read it. I like to uh, gauge it against my experience, and then I like to make up my own mind. I don't like somebody telling me what to believe or what to think. <clears throat> I want to do that myself. I'm kind of selfish. Kind of our founding fathers were the same way. So the other day somebody said, he's one of those constitutionalists. Like it was a bad word. I was like, thank you. Because <laughs> they think that that's extreme right-wing constitutionalist. Actually, no. Constitutionalist is top dead center. Everything else is to the left and the right of it. Because the Constitution is for all people, we the people. It wasn't for a certain subset of the people. It was for all people. So when they call me a Constitutionalist, I'm pretty proud about that. So. If you, re, if you look at that, the first five genealogical documents, the king shall not insert himself in the church, the king shall not insert himself in the church, the king shall not insert himself in the church, Say shame on the king for inserting himself in the church, and the last one, the king shall not insert himself in the church. What's Article 1 of the Bill of Rights say? Congress shall pass no law respecting what? The establishment of religion, right? The king, the government, shall not insert himself in the church. Isn't that great? And then we had 1913 with the 16th and 17th Amendment, where the churches decided to be 501c3s and couldn't wait to invite the king into the church. So, the 1913 and the 16th and 17th Amendment, when we get into this, you're going to see how that took us down this road to despotism, where we're at right now. This is what allowed us to get socialism into our country. This is what allowed us to take us away from this Constitution and get people to, book, to make us understand or believe that the Constitution should be uh, Darwinian rather than Newtonian. And we'll discuss those terms and what those mean. <coughs> then we're going to look at uh, Week 8, which is American history leading up to the Civil War. Uh, revolutionary War. Now everybody said, well, Civil War was, was 1861, right? So why do I have Civil War there? Why do I have Civil War there? What, does anybody know when the shot heard around the world happened? I know it's been a while. 
since school and history, April 19th, 1775, right? On uh, Con uh, Concord, Lexington Green. That's where the Redcoats came in and met with the Sons of Liberty to take the weapons, the cache of weapons that they had there. Because remember, we're always taught in school that the Revolutionary War started over taxes. I'm here to tell you that's hogwash. It didn't start over taxes. Taxes was just one of those straws on the camel's back. What really broke it and what it really started was the crown coming to take the weapons away from the colonists. And they said, no, <laughs> that's not happening here. And that's what started the Civil War. Why do I call it a Civil War? Because they were still British citizens in 1775, were they not? All the people in the colonies were still British citizens. So it was the British against the British in 1775. And it went like that all the way up to July 2nd of 1776. What's the significance of July 2nd, 1776? The Lee Resolution. The Lee Resolution. Now, a lot of people like to say that the Declaration of Independence is the birth certificate of America. And that's simply not true. The Lee Resolution of July 2nd, 1776 is what made us no longer subjects under the king, but free people. It was the Lee Resolution of July 2nd. The, uh, the Declaration of Independence of July 4th was declaring to a candid world the reasons which impel them to the separation. So they were declaring to all the other sovereign powers in the world why we were sovereign, why we stepped away from Britain, and why what the abuses were that caused us to do that. But it wasn't the Declaration of Independence that made us free. It was the Lee Resolution of July 2nd, 1776, that made us free, no longer subjects under the king, but subjects under the law. That's the key. We are a republic, not a democracy, which means we are subjects under the law. We are not subjects to mob rule, because that's what a democracy is. Then, uh, you can stay there. Um, then, uh, we're going to look at uh, Patrick Henry's speech, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death. A lot of people probably remember that one phrase out of that speech, but that speech has so much more to it. So much more to it. And we have to remember at that time, does anybody remember what was the, the Black Robe Brigade? Does anybody ever hear about that? I'll bet you didn't hear about it in high school, not in John Dewey's model public school. But the Black Robe Brigade is actually the impetus that started the people supporting becoming free and no longer being subjects under the king. It started in the churches. It started from the pulpits. And this is why it's so important not to have the king in the church. But when we're 501c3s and we operate under the pleasure of government and no longer under the pleasure of God, will we see that black robe brigade again? Not unless we get pastors and parishioners they get a strong backbone and say, we got to stop operating under the government, stop our, start operating back under the pleasure of God and to his word. It was John Adams that said, our constitution is only meant for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate for any other. So why do you think that we've seen through the 20th century the, the breakdown of morality? The if it feels good, do it generation. If the uh, go ahead and, and, and have your rights, but there's no responsibility to it. Now, ladies, I'm not picking on you, but I'm going to bring this out. The feminist movement of the 70s was all about we want the same rights, but not the same responsibility. <clears throat> Doesn't work like that. With rights come responsibilities. You can't have one without the other. They come as a package deal. So if you want the same rights, you have to take the same responsibilities that come with those rights. 
Just like, are we a country built on freedom or are we a country built on liberty? Liberty, right? What, does, what, did, uh, what did Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address say? Said that our forefathers brought upon this nation a nation of liberty, right? Liberty, not freedom. And I know everybody loves that, that uh, uh, Mel, Gib uh, Mel Gibson movie, uh, uh, William Wallace in, in uh, The Patriot, you know, they scream, freedom! Well, let's look at the difference between...